for example, I uh, want each of you to maybe say F it up a little bit in lab. Everybody has to make a compound with fluorine, right? <laughs> okay. If that's not clear, let me know. Uh, again, I expect you to read directions, notes, important things, procedures, which are essentially requirements. Um, okay. Again, if you want to do things right and have the best chance of success, okay? Um, one reason, I don't know where you're going after this class, but eventually you're going to get somewhere where you're expected to read directions and to take care of business. And if you don't take care of business, you're either going to lose your job or you ain't going to get so into or you're going to be, there will be consequences. For example, ultimately, if you're in medicine and you don't read directions and you cause a big problem and maybe hurt somebody. Okay? Reading directions. Reading something that's written. For, for me, if it's going to be written, it, it should be important, it should be clear, meaningful, and not to be just disregarded. Hopefully you agree with it. Okay, guys. Uh, we need to pick up some speed here, pick up some pace. I sent uh, IR out, and I made a video. Uh, you can print that on your own. We can talk more about it on Monday after you've had a chance to watch the video and see if there's any questions about that. But test three will be IR only. Uh, and IR is in the, um, uh, their practice problems in the workbook. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Somehow we got two, two blue handouts. Sorry about that. Uh, Green though. We can go back and pick up a few things. If we skip along the way, give you time to make sure you have worked on these first. Uh, limitations to the approach of making green yard. Two different ways to make this by green yard. You got both of them, yeah? How do we do on that? Uh, which way is better to make that compound by uh, a Grignard reaction or the sodium cyanide, cyanide being a synthon? Which way is better? Can we come up with a decide which way is better? Okay, let's look over here then. Uh, I don't think we did these. Did we do this here in the class? Yes, sir. So you can hydride um, acetamide here. Did we do this one? No. Have a product here. <coughs> it just splits the ring apart and forms them. Okay, we have a nucleophile here. We have this is a cyclic anhydride. Okay. We're going to attack one carbonyl, the up, the oxygen serves as a leaving group. Which carbonyl are we going to attack? Either one. Either one. They're the same. Uh, electrons here, electrons up. What, what's going to happen next? It, the bond between the... Electrons back down, kick off the oxygen. Again, this is my shortcut here to save some ink and some time. In real life, you've got to do a... There's an intermediate there with electrons up, right? Electrons up, oxygen anion. That's a discrete intermediate. And the electrons back down, kick off this, what do we get? Um, the nitrogen is now bonded to the carbonyl. There's an H there, and there's two methyls. That nitrogen is now positive. Where's the leaving group going? 
It hasn't gone anywhere. It just opened up, and now this is what? Oh, minus, right? Okay. Additional elimination. Additional elimination to this carbonyl. Overall, it's an acyl substitution. Now bind to the carbonyls and nitrogen. But there's a proton there. We've got to take care of the proton. What can happen here? What do you suggest? Proton transfer. This needs a proton to go neutral. That needs to lose one. Proton transfer and final products is going to be uh, this tertiary amide with a carboxylic acid here. So the leaving group really hasn't left. And so it's a feature of cyclic and hydrides where you're going to be left with a carboxylic acid here within the molecule. Okay? Uh, it's very common. It gives you difunctionality. It gives you an amide. It also gives you a carboxylic acid. Pretty straightforward. <coughs> leaving group really hasn't left. Questions? Did not, uh, okay. Uh, okay, I didn't mess up, but we have a question. Uh, what's, what's basic? Um, the N2NH. Yeah, okay, we can take care of the proton, all right? I mentioned this week one. Eventually, we're going to have to just take care of the proton, deal with proton. We dealt with a proton transfer, and now we're asking about acid base. So, is the proton going to be sitting with the ink? Yes, this is basic. Uh, this is. Uh, acidic? Yeah. The amine could take, it's not HCl, it's not as strong as HCl, but it is still probably acidic enough to react with the amine. Uh, it could be at the end that this is deprotonated, and instead of this taking the H, essentially maybe methylamine took it. And if that takes it, you know, it can take it from that, or it can take it from this after that took it. In any event, it could be at the end where we have instead of the H sitting here, the H could be sitting with another equivalent. And actually, I was thinking ahead here. That's why I said two equivalents. Uh, yes. Okay. You need one equivalent. Sort of trying to get away with it because it was a weaker acid, but. Um, so, what's this going to require to put the proton on? We need, a, we need to bring in a proton from outside, external. We need to work it up. We need to come in. And so, H plus work up to get the proton on here. Because the proton that's in the, in the flask was taken by the amine because it's more basic. And you can ask, well, what's the equilibrium here? Uh, well, the acid has a pKa of about what? Four to five. Four to five. Uh, sp3 nitrogen pKa about ten, which is favorite. Ten. ten. Yeah, <laughs> that's favorite. We're going to have to work it up. Uh, good point. Good point. Especially since I said two equivalents. Uh, again, sometimes that. Dealing with a proton like that sometimes is kind of glossed over, especially once you get to biochem. You're going to be like, especially coming from my discussion, that what happened to the proton? All of a sudden it disappeared. Well, it's because a lot of times the proton gets glossed over. And you've got to know that, well, they just decided to just no longer show the proton, something had to take it. Okay? I guarantee you, you're going to be like, where's the proton? And you're going to be told, well, it's fine, it's fine. Just please understand that uh, it just somebody has dealt with the proton but didn't really uh, clarify it. Uh, how about down here? We get something here. Uh, acetic anhydride, right? Right? Okay, make heroin from morphine using acetic anhydride. Um, 
That's our reactive or acylating reagent, reactive <coughs> carbonyl. This must be the nucleophile that we're going to get. Above, we've reacted amines with acid chlorides or anhydrate. You can also react an alcohol. These electrons attack, electrons up, back down, kick this off. What are we going to get? Somebody have a product here? Um, methyl isopropanoate. Uh, what's the name of your product? Methyl isopropanoate. Uh, give me more of an IUPAC name. Um, I don't. That there plus what? Uh, 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 carboxylic acid. Plus carboxylic acid, the leaving group is left. Uh, but this is all going to be neutral. Because any H here, the acetate will take this H. Uh, you can work through the mechanism. Again, I can't work through every single mechanism. If there's fine details, you need to work through and see it. Okay? Again, it's taking care of the proton. Uh, basically, I flipped it around. Under my hand is the O carbonyl. Now under my hand, instead of the O carbonyl bonded there, it's the alcohol that's bonded there. But we lost an H. It's now an ester. Name of that ester? <coughs> Somebody name this ester? What's what's the what's the what's the acid name of that ester? How do you name esters? Uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's an acetate, right? Because this is acetic acid. Okay, this is the acid, the portion here. You gotta know you gotta know which side's the portion. Okay. Um, all right. And if we take this off, that's called acetate. If we put a methyl here, that's called methyl acetate. If we put an ethyl there, it's called ethyl acetate, a common solvent in the lab. What do we have here? Uh, that's one, two, three. That's what, a propyl? Two methyl propyl acetate. That seem like a good name for that compound? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, some type of common name. Uh, I, I was doing it in, I, I did it in reverse, where um, I had a carbon <coughs> bonded to the, uh, the isopropyl instead of the other oxygen. Uh -huh. You've got to know which, which, which side is the acid portion, which side is the R group portion. All right. <coughs> All right. That's a key question. <laughs> and if you haven't worked nomenclature problems yet, you don't even know what question I just what I'm talking about. Alright? <coughs> but what I'm talking about is a common mistake in naming esters, and you've got to make sure you understand which is which. And it's very important to, what you want to do as a student for me is make as many mistakes as you can. Well, that's how you learn, making mistakes. And then you say, oh, I made a mistake. What can I do differently? Okay? So you want to, you want to say, let's go make some mistakes today. You just can't hurt yourself, uh, right? But you want to learn. And, and importantly, you got to make those mistakes before test day. <clears throat> you don't want to get to test day and then and, and make all the mistakes. That's, that ain't going to work out for you too well. You got to make them before test day. If you make a lot of mistakes before test day, I'm thinking you're probably going to do well on the test. Okay, uh, pyridine, not necessarily uh, required, but often, often a weak base is included with these reactions anyway, even though this is not basic and it's not going to be hurt by a proton. Often a weak base is included, we don't have time to talk about it, it can help the reaction a little bit. Uh, so really I just ignored it, we didn't need it. Uh, Um, 
again, if you think about taking care of the proton, do you kind of see where I'm trying to talk about, what I'm trying to talk about there? Uh, I think we did these over here. We're basically talking about anhydrides. We did some mixed anhydrides. Those react very nicely. Selected for one carbonyl over the other for, for different reasons. Uh, we're dealing with the anhydrides. That's an anhydride of a carboxylic acid. And usually when you say anhydride, you're talking about such. You can also have anhydrides of other acids. For example, that's phosphoric acid. If you react two of these together and remove water, you can get this. Oxygen bonded to two of these. And again, it requires you to, everything we do, it requires you to look at it on your own a little bit more because your first look, you're like, what? What's going on here? Okay, well, you need to sit down after class and see what's going on here. But the end is, this is called pyrophosphoric acid. Pyro comes from kind of heating, pyrolysis. If you heat this, at, uh, you know, in, in the lab, thermal, thermal dehydration. Uh, that's kind of where that name comes from. Uh, but this still has acidic H's. If you treat with base, you can remove them, and you can make anions on all these oxygens. And this is called pyrophosphate, and you'll actually see that in biochemistry. Okay? It's actually the anhydride. It's in the anionic form, but it's the anhydride of phosphoric acid. Well, a anhydride, you may be able to make other anhydrides of phosphoric acid. It's the most common and the most simple anhydride. So that's just a, uh, by the way, type of comment related to anhydrides. Okay, chemistry of esters. We've already synthesized esters before, so it's just the Fischer esterification. Okay, very important. Usually when a name, when a reaction has a person's name associated with it, that probably means it's a pretty important reaction. Grignard reaction, Fischer esterification, uh, Dill's Oliver reaction, okay? Uh, we'll see others uh, in a few weeks. Uh, so we've already synthesized esters. Reactions of esters. Okay, esters and amides tend to be end products. They're often made and that's kind of it. You make an ester and you don't really continue on. Lots of drugs maybe contain esters or uh, materials. Uh, I gave you a list of esters in the handout that have different scents. Scratch and sniff, okay? Uh, a lot of ester esters tend to have good smells, okay? Uh, used in perfumes. Uh, they're found in lots of fruits naturally because esters can exist in nature. Because an ester doesn't react with pure water, esters and amides do not. Acid chlorides and anhydrides do react with pure water. They're, and because of that, you, you know, find in nature, those tend to be just reactive intermediates in the lab. So ester can be a final product. So you don't do much chemistry with them, but you can. And it's important to know that you can hydrolyze them back to the carboxylic acid because any acid derivative can be hydrolyzed back to the acid, carboxylic acid. So you can take, for example, the ethyl ester here and you can hydrolyze it back to the carboxylic acid. This is from our scheme, right? We can either do with aqueous acid or you can do base. Or, this is just the reverse, reverse of the Fischer esterification. Fischer was this way where we took an acid and some alcohol in this way. We did that before. Up here, because that's, that's a way to synthesize esters, right? Well, you can go the other way. Remember, this was a true equilibrium. If you want to go that way, how would you drive it that way? We used to excess ethanol. You're going to make that plus water. It's hard to remove water sometimes, or sometimes you can. But, but if you had the ester and you wanted to go that way, how would you drive it that way? Boil off some ethanol. 
You could remove ethanol as its form. But what's another way? Uh, reactive re basin. I can't hear. Put a uh, base into the reaction. No, no, we're using aqueous acid here. Oh. How would you drive this reaction that way? Just add more. Just add more of that velocity or the, um, the ester. No, if you have more ester, you ain't going to drive it that way. You're just going to have more ester. You'll never get rid of ester. <coughs> Driving it that way means how can we get rid of this and convert it all to that? If you think about it, this doesn't make sense to, to add more of this as a way to get rid of that. All right, we've talked about that before, but we can't add excess water. We're going to just use a lot of water here. Okay, flood it with water, right? We're going to drive it that way. Just like if you want to drive it that way, we use excess ethanol that drives it that way. Okay? Uh, we already did the mechanism. It's just the exact reverse. What's the first step in that mechanism of the reaction shown? Protonate to carbonyl. Protonate to carbonyl because carbonyl chemistry under acidic conditions, proton source, protonate carbonyl. Okay? Uh, and we can get back to the carboxylic acid, and the O-ethyl is going to be lost as ethanol. It will pick up the H along the way. Again, you need to do that mechanism on your own, because we've really already done it. Uh, you can also hydrolyze esters with aqueous base. Now I've got two steps here. Let's, let's think about this next week. Hydroxide, mechanism here. We got this and we have hydroxide. That's what we got here. How are we going to get? What's the first step in this mechanism? Is it protonate carbonyl? No. No. We don't have any acid. You only protonate carbonyl under acidic conditions. But hold on, Dr. Stevens, it says acid here. <coughs> that's, that's next week. That's after you do step one. What's the mechanism for step one? There's no acid. It's basic conditions. Okay? That's, just, that's, that's later. A plus R for one, two. You got this, you got this. We don't protonate carbonyl here. Okay? Now this is also maybe aqueous. We also have water. Now esters don't react with pure water. If you use water, you've got to use acid catalyst to make it react. And that's H3O plus. That's the previous reaction. Don't react. But this ain't pure water. This is hydroxide. It's a stronger nucleophile. The stronger nucleophile will react without having to protonate. We can't protonate. We don't have any acid. Uh, this is just attacks. We can't just attack carbonyl. Protonation does make it more reactive. That doesn't mean we cannot do reactions where you don't protonate it. You can. Typically, though, it just requires a better nucleophile than just some average or nucleophile. Hydroxide is a better nucleophile. Electrons up. Okay. Well, let's do it stepwise. Okay. Electrons up. Right? Tetrahedral intermediate. What next? Strong's down. Come back down. Which one are we going to kick off? OME. Could we kick this? Which is the better leader group, OH or OME? OME. They're very darn similar. You can maybe make a fine argument. Could we kick off the OH? Sure, we're just coming back this way. The first step is equilibrium. 
on and off, on and off, on and off, on and off. But part of the time, we can do something else. Instead, we kick this off. What does that give? Give that plus OME minus. Is that it? Game done? Why do we need H plus workup? There's our product. Something's going to take this H, either hydroxide, or right here, we generated a base. This is not going to exist like this. This generated base is going to take the H, and we're going to get plus methanol, which we've already said we're going to get. This is in step one. That's how it is at the end of step one. And yes, somebody said it. This is a carboxylic acid. We're making it under basic conditions. How is it going to exist? As the anion. We see that. How are we going to get the proton on? We've got to add in some acid. What's your favorite acid? HCl. Yes, you can add in HCl or sulfuric or phosphoric or me and me and other choices. Something that's more acidic than that. You know how to use pKa's to judge equilibrium. Something that's going to go that way. Now there's water here. There's methanol here. You can say, why doesn't methanol supply a proton? Well, if it did, you would just go back here. And you can say, well, isn't this an equilibrium? And you say, well, yes, it is an equilibrium. Which side's favored? Because this is five. And alcohol is about 16. Which side's favored? 16. 16. This side. That's a, that's a difference of 10 to 11, which is what? 10 billion? So when you're done, 10 billion exists like this, and one exists like that. I pretty much say that it's all like this. 10 billion, okay? The equilibrium is like, like that. You see the other arrow? It's even smaller than that. Uh, wow, there's lots of things here we've talked about along the way over the past two semesters. PKAs to judge equilibrium, taking care of the proton, H plus workup. Remember when we first introduced the one and the two? My reactions, one, two, what that means. Uh, so that's a basic hydrolysis back to the carboxylic acid. Uh, Blue. There it is, white. And so, anything in the box, including an ester, can be hydrolyzed with hydroxide to what? Actually, the carboxylate, right? And how do we get it back to the acid with the H? We need acid, H3O+. It's just generic for strong acid. Uh, there's one you can do on your own. Basically, any acid derivative can be hydrolyzed back to a carboxylic acid. And you recognize hydrolysis because it's water and acid. It's just water and acid. Or it's hydroxide. Because hydroxide is the strongest base you can have in water. And we do need an oxygen. And by the way, let's go back. There's another possible mechanism that could be shown for this hydrolysis, but it's not correct. Did anybody think that we might do that? Let's draw this methyl out here. There's your methyl ester. This will give these products. What if instead of we attacking the carbonyl, what if this attacked the carbon and kicked off the oxygen? What does that air movement give? Your, um, from your step toward the last. It gives what we've shown over there. Doesn't it? That, doesn't that give that plus 
Methanol. But that ain't the mechanism. That's like an SN2. <coughs> where we, and, okay? And we did nothing here. And this oxygen is that same oxygen. It's not the mechanism. You could say, well, is this a good leaving group for SN2? It's resonance stabilized. Yeah, and you may sometimes see a mechanism like that. But typical hy hydrolysis of carbonyl compounds involves a reaction at the carbonyl. <coughs> okay? So this is somewhat reasonable, but this is not the mechanism. All right? Was anybody thinking of that as a possible mechanism? No. That's okay. It's, it's, it's reasonable to think that. That's why I'm taking the time to tell you that it's okay, but it's just that's not the mechanism. It's, it's reacting at the carbonyl. It's, it's acyl substitution, carbonyl substitution. Uh, basic <coughs> conditions, okay? Uh, basic conditions is often called saponification, okay? Now that's a grown-up word there, saponification. What does that mean? It means what? Making soap. Making soap, yes. That's because that's how you make soap. If you take a triglyceride and react it with aqueous base hydroxide, you can make soap that way. But what chemistry is going on? A triglyceride <laughs> is just a triester of glycerol. It's in your, in your body. It's often considered a fat because, see, here's the glycerol. It's a triester. Okay? Triester. You see the ester here? Carbonyl O and R? These are all these three esters. But the acid portion is a fatty acid. And this is how fatty acids are often sort of stored in your body. They exist as triglycerides and not actually free acids. The acid is linked to glycerol, we'll show that in a minute, as a triester. Hydroxide, what happens to esters with hydroxide? They you hydrolyze them to what? Carboxylic acid to the carboxylic acid, right? And so this is going to give uh, okay, let's draw this carboxylic acid. This is the long fatty acid here, but how is this going to exist? It'll be in the anion form, right? Alright? And we'll get the alcohol. Just like above, we got methanol. What's the alcohol here when you hydrolyze E? Basically, we're, we're lysing, lyse, clean. We're lysing it with water, hydrolysing, right? We're hydrolysing it, hydrolyzing. But what's, what's, what's the fate of the OR that's kicked off? Okay, that's three carbons. Each carbon has an OH. Alright. It's called glycerol. Or in the music industry, it's called glycerin. I know it's not glycerin? No. Okay. Alright. <laughs> sometimes it also, sometimes called glycerin. Glycerin and glycerol, same thing. But the all is more appropriate because it's alcohol. But that's glycerol. You've got to see how that comes here. You're hydrolyzing each. Add up, kick this off, kick that off, kick that off. But they're all bonded there. Hopefully everybody sees it. We balance this out. We get one of these. How many of these do we get? Three. Yeah, we actually get three of those. Okay. And so we've hydrolyzed the, each ester to the acid and the alcohol, but the alcohols are all bonded together. 
Okay. Well, what is this? It's a fatty acid. And what do you use that for? So, okay, fatty acids. Uh, look on the back of your shampoo bottle next time you take a bath. Okay, by your shampoo. Look on the back. The first ingredient is going to be like sodium myristate. Okay, well, this has got to have a plus with it. There you go, sodium myristate or sodium palmitate. These are all long fatty acids in sodium ion form. Okay, they're used as soaps. And how does the soap work? Okay. Well, organic one, I showed you how the soap worked. It was on the first hand down. Right? Because everything is all connected. Right? How does the soap work? The head group is polar. It likes water. <coughs> this is very lipophilic. It likes oils. And so the oils on your skin, get, it helps mix it with water. Because everybody's taking a bath in water, right? Anybody taking a bath in acetone? No. Okay. The problem with water is it doesn't like oils that form on your body. So the soap helps, okay, that's the anatomy of the soap. Fatty acids are used as soap. Uh, how do you make this? You watch Beverly Hillbillies? No, nobody watches that. Anybody see? Okay, Beverly Hillbillies. What did Granny make in the, back, in the backyard by the cement pond? She had it going? Making soap. How'd she make soap? Out of wood ash. Okay, yes, that's one thing. Uh, where'd the triglycerides come from? Uh, beef tallow. Uh, yeah, you you watch the uh, you watch the show, um, <laughs> or from possum fat. Okay, oh, yeah. <laughs> possum fat. I'll try to rise. Uh, where did Granny get the hydroxide from? Did she order it from Sigma Aldridge? No, she got it from where? I don't recall that. <laughs> you already said where. Oh, uh, moonshine. Uh, did you did you say wood ash? Oh, wood ash, there we go. Fireplace ashes. Okay, the ashes in the fireplace are high in carbonate. If you put carbonate in water, you're going to get hydroxide. So you take possum fat and ashes from the fireplace, put them together, okay, heat it up, okay, get your fire going underneath it, stir it up, chemistry takes place, all right. This, is this soluble in water? Yeah. It's an ion. First answer is yeah. Problem is, there's lots of hydrocarbon here. Is your soap soluble in water? A little. But if you float it in, put it in water, it'll float, right? It's not going to quickly dissolve. It takes a little time. It's a lot of fatty portion here. And when you do this, you get this stuff that floats to the top. That's the soap. And you skim it off, and you put it into a little mold, and you let it harden, and then you pop it out, and you got a bar of soap. It's just fatty acids, and it, there you go. Granny made, uh, was making soap in the backyard. And Jethro, he was busy becoming a brain surgeon. All right, anybody else watch that show? It's a good show, you should watch it. See, that's what I grew up on. Beverly Hillbilly, Sanford and Son, and a Braves game. During the week, and on the weekends, it was Love Boat and Fantasy Island. Okay? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yes. <laughs> Uh, and then there's other things like the uh, Adams Family or the Munsters or, or uh, Andy Griffith. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you, you didn't know that Granny was doing chemistry in the backyard. She was hydrolyzing triglycerides. <laughs> Saponification. She was saponifying the, the triglyceride. It's an old term. Okay, hydro hydrolysis. Leaving it with water. Hydrolysis of a lactone. What's a lactone? Okay. Nomenclature of them. You've ever seen that before? Although on the pre-course worksheet I asked you what a cyclic ester and amide were, I think. <coughs> you know that? Cyclic ester is called a lactone. See the ester here in the cyclic? Okay. Uh, give product there. At this point, I expect you to just be able to work towards products with just mechanistic thought. Do that on your own. By the way, vitamin C is a what? 
What do you see here? It's a lactone, kind of. It has a lactone portion. It's a lactone. I mean, it's many other things. It's also a visceral diol. Vitamin C is a lactone. Uh, esters. What about thioesters? Much less common. But I do like to point it out because a very important thioester, and right here is the thioester, because instead of the OH, well, it's a sulfur, but instead of SH, it's SR. It's called a thioester. It was on the first page of the warm up page. Um, but this is called, you might know this molecule. Acetyl-CoA. You can say it two different ways. How do you say it? Acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA. Acetyl some people, I think I would say acetyl-CoA. But either way. Acetyl-CoA? Acetyl-CoA? Okay. You know the structure of that? No. I have no idea that's what it looks like. <laughs> we learned it in cell bio, but... You never show structure? No. no. <laughs> you never show that, that the sort of a key portion is the thioester on the end? Not at all. No. Yeah. And what type of, uh, it's, it's a acetyl. What is it? What is acetyl? I mean, it's, it's, it's that. You watch Nova Clinch, your video? If you put a chlorine here, that's called what? Acetyl chloride. Acetyl chloride. Okay. This is acetyl. Because if this was just SH, that would be just the enzyme CoA. But it's the acetyl CoA, or acetyl group. The sulfur is bonded to an acetyl group. Um, all right. By the way, there is an application of that on one of the handouts, the uh, organophosphorus toxin, sarin, very toxic, <coughs> it's on one of the handouts in the very back, of how it, uh, how it leads to toxicity, because it inhibits the breakdown of acetyl-CoA. Well, how is acetyl-CoA broken down? Well, the acetyl group is clean. But the organophosphate <coughs> keeps that from happening, and so you get all this acetyl-CoA, and it actually can be bad if you have too much. So it makes, it makes everything go haywire if you get too much. So neurotransmitters are good, but if you got too much neurotransmitter, you're just going to, it's like having too much electricity. A little bit's good, but if you get too much, you don't have a problem. Um, at the top, what else can you do with esters? Well, as we know from our flow diagram at the beginning, you can convert an ester to an amine because we're converting an ester to a less reactive amine. It can be done. You can react this with like methylamine. Okay, you should be able to do that mechanism. It's an acyl substitution. It involves nucleophilic addition followed by elimination at some point. But again, you've got to take care of the proton along the way somehow. You make an amide. The problem here is if you want to make an amide, there's much better starting materials instead of an ester. I mean, why not just use the acid chloride? Because the chlorine will be a much more reactive carbonyl. Okay. This is going to require a little bit of heat because that's not that reactive, not that electrophilic. So while it can be done, if you want to make an amide, use the acid chloride. It's much, much easier, much better and thus much more common. Alright? Um, so in the end, esters tend to be end products, although you can hydrolyze them back to the carboxylic acid. Okay, chemistry of amides. Amides also tend to be end products. We've already looked at the synthesis, including from acid chloride and in hydrides. And even esters, such as we showed there. So what can you do with amides? They tend to be in the products, but you can hydrolyze them back to the carboxylic acid with either aqueous acid 
or aqueous base. Just like on the di flow diagram, everything leads back to the acid. Uh, you should be able to do this. I can't do every single mechanism. Uh, what's the first step in this mechanism up here? Acidic conditions. Protonate the carbonyl. Then what's the nucleophile? Water. H2O. There's no hydroxide here. You don't have hydroxide under acidic conditions. Even though you may have said you did in Genkyo. I don't agree with that. Um, because there's a difference between what you can do on paper versus what's practical. Um, uh, yeah, protonate carbonyl, then water attacks, and you can, you can get there. By the way, let's focus on the nitrogen a little bit, because in the next kind of page, we're going to have to do that. Here the nitrogen is bonded to a carbonyl. Okay? No longer. Let's use this word. I haven't used this before. Can we agree that the nitrogen has been deacylated? Because the carbonyl is called an acyl group. The nitrogen is bonded to, the, to an acyl group. And now it's not. Okay? So let's focus on that portion a little bit. Also, this is going to generate ammonia. NH3, if you take care of their proton, why did I show it like this? Because ammonia is a base. And how is ammonia going to exist under acidic conditions? It just protonate. Okay, right? Everybody agree? Down below, what's the first step in this mechanism? You attack the carbonyl. We protonate carbonyl? No, attack yeah. on this. There's no proton here. Couldn't that strong base attack the aromatic green and NAS come, those electrons go and attack? <coughs> NAS yeah. has a requirement of what? There's no pressure. Heat. First off, NAS, you're substituting a traditional leaving group like a halogen. There's no halogen on the ring. Also, you've got to have a strong electron withdrawing group or throw a pair to your... There's no NAS. There's nothing here. You can do EAS, reacting with an electrophile, but hydroxide is not an electrophile. The only thing here is uh, carbonyl chemistry. You should do this on your own. Uh, the nitrogen has been deacylated, right? Up here, maybe we focused on the carboxyl group because it's, it's sort of the bigger portion. Down here, the bigger portion was more the nitrogen portion. Of course, the acid is going to be in the basic form because we're under basic conditions, right? Taking care of the protons. Okay. Cyclic amides. I think this is what was on the pre course worksheet. Look back at it. One of the questions was, what's the name of functional groups, or what's another name for a cyclic amide, or something like this? Well, here we go. What is it? Cyclic ester is a lactone. A cyclic amide is a lactam. There's a cyclic amide. Cyclic meaning the nitrogen is sort of connected back to the carbonyl, and you've got this green. But you can still hydrolyze it. You should show the product of this. Consider the proton. Caprolactam is important because it's used to make what? Nylon. Like nylon stockings or uh, nylon. Okay. It used to be bigger back in the 40s and 50s. Nylon stockings. Uh, used to come from caprolactam. Because when you hydrolyze it, you get a certain product. But then that product can be polymerized give nylon. Okay. So it's a sort of a historically important compound. Uh, that's why I chose that one to show you. There are other lactams. Penicillin is a lactam. That's mentioned in the workbook. Okay. That's a four-member green lactam where this is, I think, what, seven? Okay. Oh, there's penicillin there. 
You see right here, four member green lactam. That lactam is very important. That's part of why it's, it kills a bacteria. The chemistry there. And that's mentioned and discussed some in the workbook, and then it gives you a question <coughs> to consider. Okay, I think we're about out of time, yeah? Uh, I see some of you in the lab today, yeah? Uh, we'll have a quiz next week, yeah? I'm trying to move along here, some guys. But again, the mechanisms are, it's, it's one general mechanism. The details have to come from you. Working it.